Mother's annual recognition event, See America Through My Eyes. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about those essays and about our students and our learners. Learners worked with tutors, teachers, and classmates to formulate ideas, construct drafts, edit, and polish their writings. The end results were beautiful and remarkable essays. The ability to read, write, and express oneself clearly is a crucial component to becoming a fully invested member of today's society. I congratulate all of our students, our volunteers, and the staff of NBLC for opening doors for a successful future. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you for all of your amazing work, and congratulations. such a privilege to have one of our elected officials here tonight with us. I know how busy you are and how much you do for the Fairfax County community, so thank you, Chair Bolivar, for taking the time. I'd also like to recognize our very dedicated leaders, the LCNB Board of Directors. We cannot take for granted the importance of strong leadership and volunteer members of the Board of Directors who take their jobs very seriously. Tonight, we have both past board members in the audience, as well as our currently serving board members. All of these people have contributed to the long-standing years of success. If I could please ask all of the members of the current board and members who have served on the board in the past to please stand and be recognized. And speaking of great leadership, I am so delighted to work with a board president who was recently re-elected by the board to serve a second two-year term, Kitty Porterfield. She is um, just so dedicated and so heartfelt in her work, and it is just such a privilege to be in partnership and have so much fun working with the chair of our board, Kitty Porterfield. And you have to know that it is a, a joy for all of us on the board to work with such a wonderful executive director. Uh, I get a chance now to introduce um, some of the people who actually who actually do the work of LCNB, um, and it is an honor first for, to recognize the community partners, um, who are just some of the people out in the community who who through their donation and through their resources help us to do our work. Um, we have, every year we choose a few um, to honor and that is a big problem because there are so many wonderful people and we have such a blessing of, of riches here in our community. Um, but this year, the three, um, of the three organizations, one is a private foundation that actually does not want to be recognized publicly, so their name is not in the program. But I have been authorized at least to tell you that the Quaker Hill Foundation, which is a small family foundation in Massachusetts, has been generously supporting the Literacy Council for over 12 years. They have contributed in that time, they have contributed over $62,000 in support for volunteer training, computer literacy, library materials, um, and many other initiatives. With respect to their limited public, uh, rec their limited wish for limited public recognition, they are not listed in the program. Um, but once again, let us give them a round. <laughs> the second community service award goes to Wells Fargo. One of Wells Fargo's corporate giving priorities is workforce development. Back in 2008, Wells Fargo recognized that workforce development begins with literacy and language instruction, like the kind that is offered by the Literacy Council in Northern Virginia. So over the past six years, Wells Fargo has contributed over $40,000 to the Literacy Council. 
Their continued support and recognition of our work is a true example of a wonderful community partner. We are pleased to have Ravi Chandra, the Wells Fargo Regional Area President here to accept the award. Ravi? Council for what they do. Um, you know, this this is great to get a nice award, but um, we're just so pleased with the work that they do, and they help to build stronger communities. And we like to invest in organizations like this that build stronger communities. So thank you for the work that you've all done, and we're excited about this award. <laughs> Finally, a, another very special community partner for the Literacy Council is, is a, an organization that has uh, been celebrating, that is now celebrating 20 years of service not only to Northern Virginia, but to the whole country. The Corporation for National and Community Service, known to us as AmeriCorps, um, uh, has been, as I say, 20 years in the country and 15 years serving the Literacy Council here. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't until actually 2004 when we started working with the Virginia Office of Volunteerism and Community Service that our AmeriCorps program really took off. It was through the support and the commitment of the staff in Richmond that our program was able to expand from two AmeriCorps workers to four, and then we became the fiscal agent for a regional grant serving Loudoun and Prince William County with eight members strengthening adult education throughout Northern Virginia. The impact of the AmeriCorps program has had on the Literacy Council's service delivery is nearly impossible to measure. And I will note that there are several um, I saw floating around AmeriCorps workers who are here. So if you find one, um, say hello and thank them. The exceptional AmeriCorps members who have served the Literacy Council over the years have changed the lives of hundreds of adult learners. We cannot celebrate their service enough. So here to accept the award on behalf of the Virginia Office of Volunteer and Community Service is Kimberly Brown, the program officer. And yes, we are celebrating 20 years. And I've been with the office since 1994. So we've come a long way, and we're just excited to receive this. And thank you. Um, this is the on, we're on the other side of receiving an award. We don't usually receive awards for this, but we, you know, we we are here to recognize our programs and our members. And but we do. thank you. For move to the part of the program that truly brings our mission to life. We are going to hear stories uh, from our learners with their very own words. The student essay contest is an opportunity for our learners to use their newfound English literacy and language skills and become a published author because all of the, of the essays that our students have written are in the booklet that you are, are published in that booklet that you hold. Um, we invite all those Literacy Council learners, both the basic literacy and the ESL learners, to write an essay. Uh, every year the topic is different. Um, as you have already heard, this year's theme is See America Through Our Eyes. These stories dem demonstrate the incredible diversity and the compelling journeys that our students take. So it is very difficult to select just three to be read aloud by their authors. 
It takes much courage to write and submit an essay as an adult with new skills, but it takes even more courage to come to the stage and read publicly to a crowd this large. Um, thank you all, all of you writers, authors, thank you all for your accomplishment and for your bravery. Marlia, Marlia Sabar is a basic literacy student who started her tutoring in January of 2012. Since then, she has gotten a job, learned how to use a personal computer. Please, Marlia, come and read your essay. My name is Maria Sabur. My experience in America is wonderful and exciting. When I came to the USA, I, di I didn't have ten dollars in my hand. Now, after 35 years, I have a wonderful husband, a 30-year marriage, and two wonderful boys. The life I have now is more than I expected when I first come to America. My family has a good life in America. My husband and I, my husband and I work very hard to give our sons a good life and a good education. Now the whole family lives well. We have our own house. My son has a good job. My husband and I are over 50 years and we are still have employment. My son has their own house. I am very grat grateful to be living in America. It is a beautiful country. It has many very nice, generous and friendly people. I am so thankful that I found the literacy council and I am improving my education and English. Thank you. in the ESL tutoring program in 2012, and because of her new language skills was promoted from part-time to full-time work, and she has had the confidence to serve as an English guide to her Korean friends. Grace, will you come and read your essay? Oh, there you are. <laughs> beautiful country. There are many big cities, beautiful mountains, and very good schools. Many of my friends love America and want to come. It was a country that can give people a lot of opportunities. I came to America with a big dream for me and my two children. But my life in America was not easy. More than I thought, the language barrier brought my difficulties. I could not use my education and my experience to find a good job. I had to work all the time to survive in America. <coughs> I really wanted to learn English, but as a single mother, it was not easy. Ironically, I wanted to learn English, but I had to work a lot. I wanted to better job, but I had to learn English first. Because of my 
poor English. I stayed in Korean community only. My world became even smaller than it was in Korea. I worked with Korean people, went to Korean markets, Korean banks, and the Korean church. I was a living American, but it was not American. So my English was not improved much even after many years. As if the time had stopped, things were not getting much better. I always had the fear of English and it affected every part of my life. I was like a little girl. When I people called, called me on the phone, I was afraid. Sometimes I'm scared. When I had a complaints at a store, I could not speak. When I received letters, I always had to ask my children. Even when my children were young, I had to depend on them to take care of bills and many things. One day, I heard about the LCNV touring program. It was very good because I was able to continue work. I studied English in my free time. Also, it was free. My tutor, Vivian Cheng, became a very good friend to me and she always encouraged me to study more. My biggest change is that I am not <coughs> afraid of foreign people anymore. Now I have more confidence and have ended my life in America because and become more things. I love making new friends from different cultures. Learning English has brought me out of my cave. I wanted to continue to study and help other people too, just like many people helped me to be better. I wanted to serve other people. America is an exciting country that has many opportunities. Thank you. After is the is in the ESOL class in Lorton. Charmaine comes to class with her family. Her husband and her daughter are all in the class together. They started in January 2014 and have had great attendance. Charmaine, we want to hear your story. Thank you for the Literacy Council to give the chance to read my essay. I really want to read it. <laughs> my name is Sharmin. I am from Bangladesh. I came to United States two years ago. My theme is I see America and I think. And I, I think America is a very beautiful country. When I came here, I did not know many of these things about the USA. But I, now I know many things about the USA. The traffic of the country is very good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> the country has many historical places. I like the beaches. I like the countries, countries all the roads. 
I think America is a very developed country because of these disciplines. The people of this country maintain their disciplines very strictly. I think America has taught, taught the people how to become independent. In this country, people have their own freedom. I like the symbol of the independence, Statue of Liberty. In America, all of the people have equal rights, and I like it very much. In conclusion, I love my country, but I like America too. I'm very happy to live here. One of the main reasons I like this country very much because I found my life partner after coming here. We live together happily at least. America is the land of the freedom and I love the justice system. special guest um, join us for this evening. Supervisor Penny Gross is here from the Mason District. Did she? Thank you. <laughs> Another longtime friend and supporter who has done so much for the Literacy Council over the years. We are so very grateful to our friends who serve on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors who are so generous to the human service community and particularly the Literacy Council, so thank you and for taking the time to come tonight. Really, I'm so excited to introduce um, our special guest speaker for tonight, Tom Jelton. As is noted in your program, we had so much to talk about, it was hard to choose what to put in the program. Tom Jelton is an award-winning correspondent for National Public Radio on international global security and economic issues and a regular panelist on the PBS program, Washington Week. His international reporting and thoughtful perspectives on the people living in those communities is what makes his work particularly relevant to the LCNB community. Tom's overseas work includes Mexico City as NPR's Latin America correspondent from 1986 to 1990, and Berlin as Central Europe correspondent from 1990 to 1994. During those years abroad, he covered the wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Colombia, as well as the Gulf War of 1990-91, and the wars in Croatia and Bosnia. Wow, really. In addition to his reporting, he has also authored and contributed to a number of books, including the one he authored, Sarajevo Daily, A City and Its Newspaper Under Siege. And my favorite, and you must read it if you haven't, Bacardi and the Long Fight for Cuba. I believe he's working on another book, which he may mention tonight. In any event, what a privilege to welcome Tom Jelton, an award-winning and well-renowned correspondent to the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. And 
congratulations to you too, Kenny, and the terrific work that the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia has done. And what inspiring essays. Can I just ask for another round of applause for this? And the theme, uh, America Through My Eyes, is uh, you know, a perfect thing for those of you students who are now graduating from this program and moving on to your lives and careers and families in this country. And clearly you are thinking about what does it mean to be living now in this country. Um, Pat is right, I am working now on another book. It's a little bit different from books I've written in the past and from the reporting that I have done in the past. This one is about immigration. It's different because, you know, immigration is generally considered a sort of a domestic subject uh, in America. And most of my work and experience has been overseas or focused on the rest of the world. But I'm interested in immigration because, of course, all, all immigrants, including I mean, you're all immigrants here in America. All of us have come from other countries, bring these other experiences, memories, recollections, and experiences to this country. And so I'm, I'm very interested in what does it mean to come to America and become American. You know, the immigration issue has become very controversial in this country. For uh, any of you who follow American politics, you know that there is a tremendous amount of debate in Washington right now about the immigration issue. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the issue of amnesty and who should become documented, who should be, have the opportunity to become citizens. That's actually not the part of the debate that is, interests me so much. Um, a lot of the debate has to do with whether immigrants are taking jobs from other people. I'm actually not interested in that part of the debate either. What interests me about the immigration experience and the immigration story is what it has to do with the idea of America, what America stands for, and what becoming American actually means. And this is a debate that goes back to the very earliest days of our country. Uh, and we have, you know, there's a lot of myths about um, immigration in America, uh, but the truth is that the idea, the, the, the issue of immigration has been controversial in America from the very beginning. Um, there are basically two ideas about America, and these two ideas have been in conflict since the beginning of the country. The first idea, is the first notion of America is that America is a place that is defined by its principles, by its values, by the Constitution, and that anyone who comes to those con this country and subscribes to those values and agrees to adhere to the Constitution and believe in the dream, anybody, no matter where you're from, if you're willing to do that, you become an American. This is a very idealistic view of America, um, and it's one that George Washington himself espoused in the very first days of the country. He said, the bosom of America, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions. So that's one idea of America. But the truth is that there has always been a second idea of America, which is basically, to simplify it, that America is a branch of Europe. That America is a nation like other nations that has its origins in a particular people, the Europeans, and even within Europe, the Northern and Western Europeans, and the particular religious heritage, the Judeo-Christian heritage. And so these are, and that you really, to become an American, you sort of have to be part of that world. You have to, in some way, sort of have some connection to Europe. So these are two contrasting ideas of America that have been sort of discussed and debated from the very beginning. And, you know, in this case, if, you're, if you believe in this second view of America as a particular ethnic and religious nation, what matters is where you come from. 
If you believe in the first idea of America, it's what is important is not where you come from, but what you become once you're in America. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville is a French writer, very young man, visited America in the early part of the 19th century, uh, and he wrote after traveling around the country for a couple of years, he wrote a book about his, his impressions of America, and he wrote that to him, America is a place where the inhabitants arrived but as yesterday upon the soil which they now occupy and brought neither customs nor traditions with them. So from his point of view, where people came from did not explain who they were. It was they left their customs and traditions and languages and histories behind them and started over. He was really impressed by the idea of a new start in America. Um, years later, we built the Statue of Liberty uh, outside New York Harbor, and there was a young American woman, Emma Lazarus, who wrote a poem that was inscribed on the Statue of Liberty. And many of you are familiar with the most famous words of that poem, uh, inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. <laughs> Again, Emma Lazarus, with these words, was expressing this idealistic view of what America should be and what America was to her. But she wrote that poem in 1883. And at the time, even at the time that she wrote that poem, there was an entire part of the world that was not allowed to come to the United States. In, the, in 1882, U.S. Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, excluding all, basically, all people from Asia from coming to the United States. So even back in 1883, we had, in, in one year, we had these two rival ideas about what was America all about. They, they were good immigrants, those who came from Europe, from and particularly, you know, my ancestors came from Scandinavia. We were considered the really good immigrants, also people from England and Germany, Northwest Europe. Those were the good immigrants, but there were bad immigrants, the immigrants who came from Asia, who came from Africa, who came from Middle Eastern countries, basically immigrants who came from anywhere else other than Northern and Western Europe. Uh, and in 1924, we had a very important law passed in this country, the Immigration and Nationality Act, that actually formalized these very prejudices into U.S. immigration policy. And every country in the world was given a quota of how many people it could send to the United States. Germany was allowed to send 50,000 people a year to the United States. Every country and in, in, in every other country was allowed, not every other country, but all the countries in the Middle East, there, nobody was allowed from Asia. Countries in the Middle East, outside Europe, were allowed 100 visas a year. And this law stayed, with some amendments, actually stayed in effect until 1965. As late as 1965, the Asian, the Chinese Exclusion Act was actually, uh, actually ended in the 1940s, but the quota system continued all up until 1965. So Korea had only 100 slots a year to come to the United States. China, only 100 slots a year. Germany, 50,000 slots a year. So you had built into this U.S. immigration policy this tremendous discrimination against anyone, basically, who was not from Europe. And that really contradicted this entire myth that America was open to everybody, as George Washington had just said. Well, in 1965, we, well, in 1964, the U.S. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act that ended, for once and for all, discrimination against people in this country based on race. It ended segre segregation in in public institutions, it, along with the Voting Rights Act, gave everybody access to the uh, 
political system, and sort of in that same spirit of civil rights, in 1965, Congress passed finally a new law, a new an amendment to the Immigration and Nationality Act that did away with national origin quotas. From that point on, from 1965 on, everybody around the world was put on an equal basis in terms of their ability to come to the United States, the opportunity to come to the United States, the chances they have to immigrate to the United States. October 2015 will be the 50th anniversary of that act. The book that I'm writing now will then look back at these last 50 years of life in America and assess what is the significance of that act for what America is now, for what being American has become. Because as you all know better than any of us, uh, the last 50 years have seen a dramatic change in the population of the country. We are now, in 2014, at the high, we have the highest percentage of foreign-born people in our population that we have ever had as a country. And the big difference is, you know, the last time we reached this, or something close to this point, was in 1920. But in 1920, 95% of the people who were coming into this country were from Europe. Now it's down to about 5%. 95% of the people who are coming to this country now are coming from countries outside Europe. So we are in this, we are in what I think is, the, is a very adventurous period, where we have, as a country, have the opportunity to show that America actually is, is not a nation that is tied to its European heritage, that is not a nation that is limited to a particular race or ethnicity or even religion, that America actually has the possibility of showing people around the world that here your race, your nationality, your ethnic origin, your language, your religion doesn't have to mean anything if you are willing to become an American. And I have, in the course of writing this book, I'm trying to, and I'm focusing, and it's so perfect that I'm here, because I really am focusing on Fairfax County. Chairman Bova uh, was kind enough to, the very early period of my research, to meet with me. Also, I met with Supervisor Gross, and actually, particularly you, Penny, because Mason District within Fairfax, I mean, Fairfax County as a whole is just an amazing example of what immigration has meant for this country, but the Mason District in particular, where if I'm not mistaken, Penny, I think 50% of the people living in, in the Mason District right now were born outside the United States. Is that right? Something close to it, right? Yeah. So um, I have, in the course of writing this book, I've identified sort of a half a dozen families, uh, not necessarily the immigrants who came here and became millionaires, you know, huge success stories. I've actually been looking for immigrants who stories were sort of typical stories. But what I have found in, in all the cases that I've looked at is an incredible determination to, to persevere, to, be, to become successful, to work hard, to study, to learn English, to become, in the end, a US citizen. And it's been a real testament. One of the, thing, one of the schools that I have looked at in particular is Jeff Stewart High School, which is in Mason. Mason District that has had a very high percentage of immigrants for years and years and years and a tremendous program and I think this is the one program if I were to actually have to highlight a program that exemplifies what you know the the Americanization assimilation process should be about it's the English for uh, it used to be called English as a second language it's now, it's now English for students of uh, speakers of other languages ESOL Jeb Stewart High School had, in the 1980s, that was the largest department in the high school. 15 teachers dedicated to teaching students of other language backgrounds to become fluent in English. And the success that they had was really tremendous. A number of these immigrants that I have focused on in this book actually arrived in high school without speaking a word of English and still managed to graduate on time because precisely because of the dedication of those teachers and the willingness of those students to really apply themselves and learn. And they have all now become US citizens. So that, I have really been inspired uh, in the course of doing the research for this, for this book. On people like you, 
as students, on those of you who are teachers, because you are the ones that are making this dream uh, come alive. However, I do want to close with uh, a story that bothers me a little bit. And I think this are less, there are lessons to be learned from this as well. I, I tracked down one of these old ESL teachers who's been at it, started as an ESL teacher, I'm not going to say his name, but he started as an ESL teacher in 1975, so he has taught thousands and thousands and thousands of students. And right now, he is feeling somewhat discouraged. And the reason is because he has found a lot of his students now only want to learn enough English to get a job. And they don't even care if it's a really good job. They just want to get a job that pays $15 or $20 an hour. Once they get a job, he is finding too many of them drop out of the program. They're satisfied with just a sort of minimal achievement. And that, to me, is not the promise that these programs have. The promise that these programs have is that they give you a foothold, they give you a foundation, they get you started, they get you headed in the right direction, but then you've got to take the rest, take it on your own the rest of the way, and you can't be satisfied with a $15 or $20 an hour job, you can't be satisfied with just sending money back to your family back you know, in the country that you came from. You have the opportunity here to become a citizen of a great nation, but it's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take many years, and I just hope that you can stick with it to the end. Um, but it's a, it's, I'm so inspired by your stories, I'm anxious to read all the essays in your book, maybe I'll quote some of them in my book, but um, it's a terrific story. I applaud the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia, and I congratulate all of you graduates for doing what you've done so far, and I encourage you to keep on moving ahead. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Wow, that is really something, isn't it? We had a whole history lesson, and don't you just appreciate so much how the Literacy Council has fit right into that? Yes. And and how our, our students who are seeing America through their own perspective are right on target what, with what Tom has said. This, it's all fitting together, isn't this great? Thank you. What a privilege to have you here today to share of the research you've done, and I can't wait till the book comes out. It'll be really fun. So we'll move on now to recognizing our outstanding students. All of the students that we're going to recognize tonight were nominated by their teachers or their tutors for their dedication to learning, their perseverance, and their accomplishments. You guys are the reason that the Literacy Council is in business. Your success stories become our success stories, and that's why we love doing what we do. So, I'm just gonna highlight what Tom said. Please continue with your studies. Please go on, take the next steps, keep going, and just reach the highest dreams that you can reach. So I'm gonna invite some learners on the stage now and so we can be recognized. All of the students who are holding a card Guys, get a card when you checked in. Please come up to the stage right now. Up on the seat, walk up the steps, and we will call out your name, and Kitty and Tom will say congratulations. All right, here we come. Eddie Williams. Eddie. Okay, Eddie Williams. Kim Adams. David Bell. Geraldine Washington. Fatima 
Ez az Anmari Unit. to all of our outstanding students for 2014. Thank you so much for all of you. Now we're going to move on to recognizing some of our volunteers. The Literacy Council has many volunteers who deserve recognition and appreciation. Last year, LCMB volunteers contributed 35,000 hours of their time, adding an in-kind value of $869,000 to our financial statements. That is a big contribution to service. <laughs> Think of all the teaching that is being done with that many hours of service and that very, very valuable commitment of time. So first we'll recognize volunteers who were nominated by their students as outstanding tutors and teachers. Every volunteer in the room who received a certificate for being an outstanding tutor or teacher, please stand and be recognized. Let's give you all a big round of applause. We also want to recognize volunteers who have put in many, many years of service. If you are receiving an award for five years of service, and you're in the playbill so you know who you are, please stand and be recognized. Five years of service, that's a long time. And believe it or not, we have volunteers who have given 10 years of service. Now, those of you who have given 10 years of service, I will call out your names. You know who you are. I would like for you to come up the stairs. We're going to get a big group photo. So, is Kathy Chamberlain here? Angela Chastain. Nancy Coughlin. You guys just being shy? Um, Alana Duckett? You guys here? If you guys are here, you better come up. Take your poop shot. Robert Fredico? Laura Johnson? Elizabeth McGee? Wow. A lot of no shows tonight. These are people who don't like to be recognized. Joan Roberts? Jane Roth, Diana Ruth, James Sherald, Martin Smith, Martin Smith is here. and Bob Stump. Bob Stump here tonight? Okay, well you guys stay right there because we're going to bring up some friends 
who believe it or not have been here 15 years. Yeah, really? I know, it's impressive. So let me read off the two names of people who have been here 15 years. I hope they're here. Neva Harrington. These people are really shy. Denise, Denise Murray. You know what I'm thinking about literacy council people? They tutor and teach because they love the quiet of, their, of the learning experience. They're not the big extroverts in the world who like to stand up and be recognized. All right, so here's the final trick. 20 years of service. And these people, it's in the playbill. We actually have people with 20 years of service and more, believe it or not. But let me call out the names of the 20 year people and you guys come down here because we are gonna get a group shot. Avis Black, 20 years. Joan Bybee and Diane Millen. Wow. But isn't that cool? Let's just give these guys a round of applause. Did you get a great group shot there, Ruba, of our amazing volunteers? Thank you all so much. That's an incredible contribution. And finally, finally there are three volunteers. This happens every year where we, we decide that we're gonna recognize three volunteers, and then we have a really hard time choosing who we're gonna be. But, so, um, so this year, we decided on these three, and I will tell you why. We'll start with Elise. I already know Elise is not here tonight because you know what? She's one of those people that hates being recognized. And she already told me she was going to be traveling. Um, they're in the Canadian Rockies right now. That's a pretty good excuse for not being here. Um, and she told me she was really pleased to be recognized and she was so happy to miss this event because she just didn't want to be here. So it's a win-win for us because you know what? We're going to recognize her anyway. I'm going to tell everybody how great she is. And then when you see her, you can tell her I did that and we can all just clap for her. Elise started at the Literacy Council 15 years ago. She worked as an ESOL tutor. And she did that for a while and she was so great that she decided to become a placement advisor. So she worked as a placement advisor. And she did that for a number of years. And then she joined the LCNB staff as the ESOL tutoring program specialist. And she worked on the staff for 10 years. But she didn't stop volunteering. I mean, so she works on the staff 40 hours a week, but she said, but I'm not gonna quit doing my job as a PA because I really love that and I wanna keep doing that. So she kept doing that and she kept touring. So now she's working like 87 hours a week for the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia, and she just kept doing that. So she is being recognized for really probably 15 years of service, but at probably about 80 hours a week. And for that, she didn't even want to be recognized. Well, she finally retired. She, she retired as a staff person in January, and it broke my heart to have her leave the staff, but she really kind of deserved it. And then she still hasn't stopped volunteering. So she's still a PA, and then she came back in two weeks ago and said, I'm really not enjoying retirement, so I'll probably pick up some more volunteer work. So for this amazing volunteer, Elise Brummel, who just won't ever stop volunteering for us, let's just give her a round of applause. Okay, and the second one we're gonna talk about is Martin Smith, who just came up here because he was a 10-year veteran. Martin Smith is one of these great volunteers who works in the Literacy Council office. So he comes every Tuesday morning from 9.30 to 12.30 or 1.30 to work in the office doing whatever we ask him. Most recently it's been a lot of data entry, super dull, but he is such a great guy and he's really funny and he's really smart and everybody just gets so excited in the office every time he comes in. Like, oh, it must be Tuesday Martin's here. You just feel the whole staff perk up. Totally low-key guy. Um, never, hardly misses. He's on time. Takes his job so seriously, he might as well be part-time staff. So, you know, all those quarterly reports that come in from you tutors that I know you do regularly, because that's your job, and you send in all that information. Well, Martin Smith is sitting behind the scenes typing that all into our very old access database. So for 10 years, for solid work, responsible behavior, 
being like the best staff person you can ever be, except when he's a volunteer, let's all recognize Martin Smith. Martin Smith. Claire Brown. Claire Brown has started, I think it was in 2006, as a basic literacy volunteer. She worked with Jack Spinner, and I don't know if any of you saw that original video we did and put online about the Literacy Council and Claire Brown and Jack Spinner were the tutor learner star pair. So we just thought she'd be a tutor for life. Well, she's had several students since then and is not only a tutor, but then she became a placement advisor, and she has a very big placement advisor region, so she supervises about 25 to 30 matches throughout the year. And she's, she joined the tutor training team, so now she's teaching new volunteers how to be a really good basic literacy tutor. Well, and then on her own, she's really good. She's a great trainer. So if any of you have not taken Claire's training, she's good. And then she started her own little project because she's so passionate about her work. She observes her tutor learner pairs. So she's got, imagine this, she's a volunteer. She's got like 25 to 30 active matches going on in this region. She drives around and watches them and observes their teaching and then provides teaching tips and follows up with them and make sure that the people in, who are in her little region are really learning, meeting their personal goals. Now this isn't a, necessarily a part of the job, but you may have to make it part of the job because she's so good. So Claire, for going above and beyond everything and being an amazing individual serving the basic literacy too. Congratulations. how life is just extraordinary here with the commitment that we get from members of the community like you. It, it is, it's truly a privilege to work with all of you. Now, I want to close tonight by recognizing just a few more people because it's so important. And that is our AmeriCorps members. Our AmeriCorps program, we, we recognize the AmeriCorps organization for providing these members to us. These, these young professionals are really something else. Uh, the Literacy Council now, as was mentioned, we are the fiscal agent for a large AmeriCorps grant. We train eight young professionals. Two of them work at Loudoun Literacy Council, and two of them work at Beacon for Adult Literacy in Prince William County, and four of the members stay here and serve with the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. They work 35 hours a week in service teaching in the ESOL programs and their respective agencies for a very tiny living stipend of $16,000 a year. These kids are fabulous. And what they bring to the Literacy Council in terms of dedication, quality teaching, energy, passion, enthusiasm, it just can't be matched. And so I would like to call to the stage all eight of our AmeriCorps members who are currently serving with us. And I just don't know if I can remember all of the names. Okay, Candace Childress and Joe Alter serve with Beacon for Adult Literacy. Carrie Robinson and Stephen Hours serve at Latin Literacy and at the Literacy Council of North Virginia, we have Xavier Munoz, Tristan Miniaga, Shawnee Brown, and Renato Vila, all here tonight.
show. Is this an amazing group of young people or what? about this great group. So um, Xavier is in his second year of service with the Literacy Council and has agreed to serve a third year. Wow. Are we like so privileged? Fabulous. <laughs> Harry, Harry Robinson serving with Loudon is also in her second year of service with them. So she completed two service years with Loudon Literacy Council. I know they're grateful. And next year, Shawnee Brown will be serving with us again, so we have Shawnee for a second year. <laughs> not, not only do they starve to death for one year, they sign on for another. It's just <laughs> truly phenomenal. Now, I know Kimberly Brown has something that she would like to say about Xavier. Xavier has been an extraordinary American member this year. He received a national recognition award this year. The White House selected 10 national award winners to receive the Cesar Chavez Champion of Change Award. Xavier Munoz, from our staff, was one of them. Wow. We went down to the White House to all the degrees to the national Truly exceptional leadership. And Kim, I'll turn the mic over to you. Tell us what you want to do. I just wanted to say you could point to Xavier. Oh, Xavier. Sorry. <laughs> the Office of Volunteerism and Community Service. What we've done in 2013 was recognized um, our AmeriCorps members. We have 22 AmeriCorps program, programs around this, across the state. And their AmeriCorps members submit su uh, success stories or stories like reflection stories. And so it really talks about um, their service to their communities. And so we've asked them to submit them for member of the month. And for the and it's a very hard task for staff. We get the nominations in from our program directors and program staff, and then we have to select the members, and that's really really hard because they're all so wonderful. We love our AmeriCorps state members. We just love them because they do so much, so much for our communities. This month, the month of March, actually, Xavier Munoz um, is the winner for the member of the month for the month of March. I'd also like to say that we've had nominations, and the nominations keep rolling around the year, so all of these members might end up being a member of the month. But I want to recognize the nominees. Um, uh, Shawnee Brown has been also a, nomina uh, a nominee. Candace Childress. Raise your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Shawnee Brown. Okay, Shawnee. Candace Childress. <laughs> and I believe there was one more. Cat, uh, Cat Carrie. Carrie Robbins. <laughs> and Xavier, we want to present you with a certificate for the member of the month, and we also have a, a, a little gift for you. So, AmeriCorps members always love gifts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I think that wraps up our program for tonight. Um, I do want to thank our amazing theater support staff from Fairfax County Neighborhood and Community Services. Dan, Dan Schrader has been helping us with the sound and lighting, so thank you. And of course to all of you who took the time to come tonight and celebrate all of the successes of our learners, our volunteers, and this wonderful community, and particularly our elected officials who I know have terribly busy schedules and spent the evening with us. 
So please now join us for a reception in the classroom. Um, cookies, punch, I don't know what they've got down there, but I know it's good and it's fun and, and we can just enjoy each other's company. So thank you again and congratulations to all of you.